Elvis is back in the house. We are missing Scott. We're missing Haney. We don't have the five Elvises like last year. I'm going to try and do my best, though. We're going to talk about stroke updates in 2018. And I'm here to tell you that the future is now. All of the things that we thought were coming over the last two decades have finally arrived. And now the key for us is going to be to figure out which of our patients are eligible for these new therapies, which small subset of patients are going to benefit from them, how do we identify them, and then how do we get them to where they need to go to get that therapy done. Now, if we go back in time to 2015, things were really simple for stroke. Somebody came in with stroke-like symptoms, you got them a non-con head CT, there was no blood, and then you decided, is this patient eligible for Alteplase or not? Most of us were using a three-hour time window. ASEP pushed it to four and a half, kind of pulled back from that recommendation, and it all really depended on where you worked, what your local protocol was. But in general, that was it. All you needed to know was the number, you needed to get that head CT done, and then go through a checklist to see if they qualify. It was actually very similar to what we were doing from 1995 when NINS came out. Not that much changed in that two decades. And we had a hint that neuroendovascular therapy was coming. We kept being told it was coming. It made sense. It worked for MI. Alteplase was replaced by PCI to a great degree. And so this should work for brains too. Let's just put a stent up there. Let's suck out a clot. But we had three studies in 2013, IMS3, Synthesis, and Mr. Rescue, that all said, this doesn't work. It doesn't lead to better outcomes. In fact, it may actually worsen outcomes. Since 2015, we have seen a lot of change. What has changed since that time? We've had the first set of studies coming out saying neuroendovascular therapy works for a certain subset. So the big study was Mr. Clean, 2015. This was the first study to show a benefit to neuroendovascular therapy for patients with stroke, but just a very small group. It was only patients with large vessel occlusions. That was defined as either an MCA, an anterior cerebral artery stroke, or a distal intracranial carotid stroke. If you had an occlusion, an obstruction in one of those three vessels, then maybe neuroendovascular therapy could be for you. And for Mr. Clean, they had a six-hour cutoff. You had to come in within six hours, you got all to place first, and then it was followed by neuroendovascular care. And this showed a big benefit. Since then, we have had eight studies. Seven out of eight of those studies have said, you know what, morbidity is reduced. Disability is reduced by doing neuroendovascular care in this group. And each of those studies changed things a little bit. So it went from, you know, it's, just, it's not just we're looking for the large vessel obstruction. We're not just looking for that MCA, anterior cerebral artery stroke, or the internal carotid stroke. We also want to see a patient with a small infarct and a big penumbra. Lots of tissue that is at risk, but is not dead. And then they started expanding the windows as well. So that window went from 6 in Mr. Clean to 8 to 12 to 16 and then to 24 hours. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Before we embrace this, though, we do have to stop and say, were there issues with these studies? And there were. None of these studies were blinded, which, you know, I'll give them. It's a little bit hard to blind. I'm going to jam this big catheter in your brain, or I'm not going to jam this big catheter in your brain. That's fine. They were all industry-sponsored, so now we see some biases starting to sneak in. And every study after Mr. Clean stopped early. So when Mr. Clean came out and said, hey, you know what, there's a benefit here, then all of the subsequent studies came out, and they said, you know what, we did an interim analysis. Thank you for my wig. We did an interim analysis. Yeah, this isn't ridiculous at all, Rob, you're right. We did an interim analysis. There's a benefit here, and so we're going to stop our trials early. And stopping early is okay, but it overestimates the amount of benefit. So we don't know the degree to the benefit, but there is clearly, clearly a hint of benefit. There's clearly a, a, a pattern of seeing a benefit in that small group of patients. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line from all these studies is that if the patient has a large vessel occlusion, MCA, anterior cerebral artery, or the internal carotid artery, and they have a small infarct with a large penumbra, we should consider neuroendovascular therapy. That's kind of the bottom line from all of these studies. But what is the time window? When are we saying, you know what, yes, this patient has a large stroke, but we're out of time, it's too late, we can't help them. So again, that window got bigger and bigger. And the last two trials that came out, Diffuse and Dawn, had said, you know what, we can push this up to 16 and 24 hours. And the AHA embraced that. The, AMA, uh, the AHA and the uh, um, Stroke Association have said, if the patient is up to 24 hours out, and they're in that small subset, we should consider neuroendovascular care. 
Sounds kind of simple. You know, now all those wake-up strokes, we might be able to do something for it. They have a big stroke, but it becomes really complicated. Things were simple in 2015. Now we've complicated this even more. So now I have to think, well, anybody who comes in with stroke-like symptoms, should I activate a stroke code? And I don't know about your places, but that's what my place does now. Anybody who comes in with stroke-like symptoms up to 24 hours out is getting a stroke code activation. That's a huge amount of resources going to the bedside for that patient. And remember, only a small group can benefit. In the studies, those nine studies looking at this question, each of these sites that enrolled patients, each of them being stroke centers, enrolled one to two patients per month per center, which means the vast majority of our patients with strokes are not gonna qualify for this. But we're gonna activate a stroke code for all of them. If you work in EMS, should I bypass the small hospital to go to the stroke center on every stroke? It's crazy. It's crazy the amount of resources that we'd be throwing behind this. And remember, to find that large vessel occlusion, I gotta do a CTA. So now are you saying that I should do a non-con head CT followed by a CTA on every stroke patient up to 24 hours out? It's a lot of work. Oh, and I forgot, we gotta find the big penumbra. So that's CT perfusion or MRI diffusion perfusion. That's a lot of resources thrown behind this. So what we have to do, what we have to get good at is finding the patients who are at risk for a large vessel occlusion. In most of these studies, they use an NIHSS greater than or equal to six. If you're greater than or equal to six, then you got put into a pathway saying non-con head CT, CTA, and if you see that occlusion, get the perfusion or the perfusion diffusion imaging. The NIHSS stroke scale is good because we all use it, we're familiar with it, but it's not very specific. We're still gonna overactivate. So Weingart sent me a paper a couple of months ago looking at something called the VAN assessment, vision, aphasia, and neglect. And this was much more specific than that NIHSS greater than six. And it was just as sensitive. So we didn't miss anybody, but we overactivated less. The nice thing about the VAN assessment is that the entry is have the patient stick their arms out. If there's no pronator drift, if there's no weakness, they do not have a large vessel occlusion, which means that EMS, nursing, us at the bedside, in 10 seconds, I can determine if the patient has a large vessel occlusion or not or at least I can determine who does not have it. And in that VAN paper, they were able to exclude 30% of strokes presenting to their hospital just by having them stick their arms out and looking for weakness. The problem with the study is it's only a pilot. We need more validation on it, but it is something to look at. Now I'm gonna put up a slide. This slide is a workflow that myself, Salim Razai, and Evie Marcolini put together. Don't worry about taking pictures. Don't worry about memorizing it because it's in your handout. It's in the show notes. It's all there. This is free open access. We want you to reproduce this, throw it around. Evie Marcolini is a neurointensivist. We worked really hard on this to say, this is what we think is the protocol now, or this is our algorithm now with neurointerventional care at play. This is how we are working up our patients. So there are still questions about this. In all of these patients, if they come in under four and a half or six hours, they're getting systemic lytics followed by neurointerventional care. We don't know if that's the best thing or not that systemic lytic dose might actually be increasing that patient's chance of having a bad outcome. So there's ongoing research now looking at not doing that systemic lytics, just doing the neurointervention. The other big question is, with all of these perfusion and diffusion studies being done, what we're finding is that there are patients coming in an hour outside of symptoms that have a big infarct, small penumbra, and no therapy is gonna help that patient. It's not gonna be all to place, it's not gonna be neurointerventional care because they've already infarcted. But we're also finding patients up to 24 hours out who have small infarcts and large penumbra. The time is brain mantra, that time is brain idea, it's gone. We're gonna be moving towards perfusion. We're gonna be moving towards perfusion and diffusion MRI. I think in the next couple of years, we're gonna see more and more of that. We're gonna see more and more of you get the non-con head CT and then get a perfusion CT while you're there. See if that patient actually has any brain tissue that we can salvage. Because if they don't, then we're only increasing that patient's risk. So the summary is that finally neurointerventional care is here, but only for a small subset of patients. Large vessel occlusions. That's the MCA, the ACA, the carotid. Large vessel occlusion, small infarct, large penumbra. We need to think about this. If we don't work at a place that does neurointerventional care, we need to think about transferring that patient. We need to keep an eye out for whether we should be giving lytics or not, and maybe this is gonna to extend to all stroke care of doing perfusion imaging in addition to that non-con head CT. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>